welcome, Vishal. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. Um, just for our viewers, I wanted to just really give people a bit of a, a flavor of who you are. You're a founder and CEO of Contexa, the first unicorn in 2023, and so far the only one. Um, and Contexa is an AI decision intelligence company, so we're going to hear a bit more about that shortly. But what an incredible journey you've been on. You're in 29 cities now. And as a business, you really are making changes that improve society, that improve economic performance. So um, I'd like to start with asking you a very broad question. What does sustainable growth mean to you? Thank you, Bina. And, and look, a huge pleasure to be here with you today. And thanks again for the invite. Um, our two firms have been partnering for a number of years. And um, since I uh, started Quantexa in 2016, uh, as you say, it's been a pretty amazing journey to date. And um, we have transformed industries. Uh, we continue to transform the way people make decisions. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's a huge privilege to be um, the CEO of, of Quantexa. <clears throat> From a sustainable growth, I think a lot of organizations, a lot of leaders will define e um, sustainable growth in, in different ways. Um, for us, um, I'll go back to some of the key principles of Contexa about doing the right thing. And, you know, if we look at it from a sustainability perspective, you know, we offer um, our platform and our capabilities to clients in all different areas as they make um, decisions, if that's around protecting their organizations, supporting them to optimize their organizations, or even helping them to grow. And sustainable growth for me is to ensure that our clients are growing with our platform, whilst Contexa take a stance from an ESG perspective and endeavor to be not just carbon positive, um, which is a journey, but to be carbon at least neutral to become carbon positive uh, in the short to medium term. And from our own sustainable growth perspective here at Contexa, we continue to partner with firms like Altruistic as well as Ecology so that we are providing internally a scalable but also sustainable way to continue to grow Contexa. You talked about transforming your clients' businesses. You talk about protecting, protecting businesses, optimizing them and helping them to grow. So could you just maybe share a little bit more for our audience about what it is Contexa does to create and contribute to a sustainable future? Over the last 20 or so years, um, many people have said, uh, you know, we're on this digital transformation. We're digitizing data so that, um, you know, our front end staff, um, our clients can take better use of their data to ensure they make, you know, better decisions when it comes down to um, getting new loans, um, you know, processing claims if it's an insurance client or, you know, catching fraudsters who are uh, defrauding uh, the organization or the economy itself. Now, that's been a, a journey for many organizations, and it starts off with the data. The data is the new oil, and that's a, a cliche, but it's pretty fundamental when it comes down to being able to make those faster, better, um, transparent decisions. So what we, hear, what we do here at Contexa is support our clients by putting meaning in the data. What does this data actually mean? How can our clients trust that data? And how we go about doing that is by contextualizing data. If you're looking at a, a data stream or a data source in its isolation, it tells you something. But the absence of data can also tell you something completely different that that one source of information does not tell you. So what we do here at Contexa, we help our clients to stitch silo data together in a scalable and transparent fashion to empower them to make those better trusted decisions. And today we help banks, insurers, government, healthcare, as well as telecommunication clients to make those better and accurate decisions. I just want to talk about Quantexa and its journey. You became a unicorn in 2023, so congratulations on that. What an amazing feat in an economic environment that we're currently in. But that plays to the business you are. Um, how did that moment compare to any other significant moment in your journey so far? Great question, uh, Bina. And evaluation is a number. And if you let that moment overtake you, it can be quite disastrous. 
So, fantastic achievement this year. Um, we are delighted to welcome GIC, um, who are an incredible, thoughtful investor. They're an investor that take a much more of a long-term view in their investments. They're an investor which, you know, have been looking in this market for a leader in this space for many years. And through their research, through their process, you know, we were identified as one of those potential winners. And it's, it's a huge um, moment for the industry that a British tech company uh, founded here in the UK uh, has made a unicorn status. But just like with any moment across the last seven and a half years from, you know, when we first presented our platform to one of the largest banks, um, um, which was HSBC back in 2017, to the first go live we had of our platform where people were getting that insight and making those material differences. And these are fundamental material difference from capturing for fraud to stopping human trafficking, sex trafficking, to supporting organizations in their more corporate objectives around uh, cost, around revenue, to other key milestones like my 100th employee, to my, you know, my 10th city opening we had of Contexa. Um, you know, I, I look at all of these moments and they've all been fantastic on the journey. And God willing, there will be even more of these opportunities and these moments in the future. But, you know, just like with any, um, I'll use an old football cliche, you know, you're only as good as your last game. And, you know, we, we, we celebrate that success we had in April. But it's, you know, that's behind us now. My and the company's view is now we've hit 1.8 billion in valuation. How do we make Quantexa a $10 billion company? And right now, my focus is to continue to deliver on our promises uh, for our clients and our partners and our employees and continue this sustainable growth that we've already had in the last seven years for further years ahead. Every time I speak to you, your ambition is always quite inspiring. And we talk about, you know, the exponential growth of data. I mean, it's, everybody's dealing with it, but that's at the heart of what you do. You work with businesses of all sizes. You've taught, you've named a number of clients there already. Um, I know a little bit about the alliance that we have with you, and we've really enjoyed working with you and, and our clients over a number of years. Um, corporate purpose has come under scrutiny, and more so recently. And you have been really clear that your co your purpose is to create a much better world than the one I came into, which I think is a lovely way of cap capturing impact. Um, do you feel you've achieved that or you're achieving that? That is a continuum and it's a journey. Have we started that journey? Absolutely. Are we there? Hell no. There is plenty more to do. There's plenty more, I feel, that Contexa can provide. And I believe as an ecosystem with our partners like KPMG, I think working together, we can do far more than working in isolation. And what I started in 2017, which was the kickoff of our, of our technology academy, which is fundamentally allows an ecosystem to partner together to go and solve some of those hardest problems for our clients. And the <clears throat> Technology Academy here at Contexa today, we've had more people certified on Contexa than Contexans, which is a huge milestone. So that means we have got partners like KPMG, clients like HSBC, who have all, who have all um, gone on the training academy and have certified and are now deploying our capability in their own environments, which is a huge win. But you're absolutely correct, uh, Bina. It is... A, it, this is a journey for Contexa, and if I can if I can leave both the ecosystem um, and you know other parallels to the ecosystem in a better place than where I started, then I would have done my job as the CEO and founder. Talking about ecosystems, um, we know that government and business have a very important role to play together to improve um, impact, whether it's societal, economic, et cetera. Um, our Prime Minister recently did give a shout out to Context as being the most innovative technology company that he's come across, which is, which is a great accolade for you. How are you delivering better outcomes in, in partnership with government? 
We've been partnering with the UK government for a number of years, and we've had a lot of success uh, to date, which could be around uh, fraud detection. Um, so we announced a, um, a contract earlier this year with the PFSA, uh, which is a continuation contract uh, for the great work we did off the back of the COVID-19. Um, um, uh, uh, but we're, again, just starting. Our partnership with the UK, and, and very similar to other countries in the world, such as Singapore, you know, we continue to innovate in our platform. We continue to challenge ourselves, as well as the ecosystem, on, on better ways of doing things. It's very exciting times ahead. Um, you've talked about fraud a number of times in our conversation, and fraud is the most common crime, and it costs billions to the economy. Um, do you think businesses are taking that seriously enough? Um, and what advice would you give businesses? So, fraud is not new. Um, and, you know, with any industry, they will be challenged with fraud in lots of different ways. You know, if it's a bank, it could be, you know, scams. It could be around um, customers being duped of their information um, and then being compromised. It could also be, you know, where clients or of, of the bank have um, opened up fictitious bank accounts and are then defrauding the bank. Um, you know, fraud is, as I say, not new and is definitely you know, an area of investment that many industries are doing, um, if that's in government, if that's in insurance, and so on and so forth. From a C-suite perspective, and from a, a head-off perspective in those organizations, I think sometimes the challenge is that we get very hung up in looking at for the golden bullet when it comes down to fraud detection. And I don't think any CEO of any tech firm would say that their technology is the golden bullet. Um, but organizations do need to take that step. They do need to invest into technology, but technology is one component. You know, the old people process uh, technology and data sort of framework that many um, ex-consultants like myself would be talking to firms about. Um, it's, it's about bringing all of that together. And you know, if I look at some of the great um, results we've achieved with our clients, it's by bringing that journey together around, yes, I might show you fraud. It might look absolutely clear cut, but if you don't have a process in place to manage that fraud, then I'm showing you something that you don't really wanna see. So ensuring you have that process, ensuring you have that policy in place, allows technology companies like myself to be successful in a detecting it but also stopping it at the front door in prevention and you know i've been on this journey for over you know 15 years with organizations where we have gone from the detective way of looking at fraud to stopping it at the front door and there is a lot of investment right now at stopping it at the front door yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm, I'm sensing the move to prevention rather than just sort of facing into what's there. Um, you talk about tackling financial crime and you did talk about data a little bit earlier. The challenge is trust in the data and you, you've, you've said that many times and what is it telling you? And trust is really important. How do you manage that? It's a very um, thoughtful question, uh, Bina. So trust is critical. You need to be able to trust the data. And what does that actually mean? Well, trusting the data, what's the lineage of that data? Where did that data come from? Has it been manipulated? Has it, you've taken a different view of that data to before you start your analytics? Have you contextualized that data? So, you know, we've deployed our platform for things like anti-money laundering across the US, across Europe, across Asia, and so on and so forth. Now, with, with those regulators that we've, obviously our clients have deployed the platform for, the burden of truth around why did you alert this customer but not these customers? Why you found this to be risky and not this to be risky? What data did you use and can you prove that you've used the correct data as part of your modeling? These are real fundamental things when it comes down to transparency in the data. So to achieve trust, you need to understand transparency. You need to understand context. And um, more and more, you need to understand what is that meaning of that data.
And so talking about context, it's quite interesting because a lot of the conversations I have today and that are happening around the boardroom or around AI and specifically chat, chat GPT and how do you use the information that is with or without context, right? So, so I think it's a really topical thing in the boardroom today. And I guess it's at the heart of all your solutions too. So I'd be interested to hear how you feel that's affecting your business just as much as how you see that affecting your clients' businesses. I would say in the last six months, Bina, I've been invited to probably about seven very large organization board meetings to demystify AI, machine learning, and so on and so forth. And a lot of people, you know, call it AI, machine learning. It's AI. Machine learning is a subcategory of AI. It's AI. So there's been a bit of education, educating the market around <clears throat> AI is here to stay. It's not a fad that's going to disappear tomorrow. It is there with tangible results, with tangible outcomes. If that's, you know, allowing organizations to reduce the time it takes to onboard a client by 80%, or if it's around detecting fraud in real time to finding new prospects to bank within 30 minutes instead of six weeks. These are all outcomes of using the best of AI with context. Now, so that's a, it's been a big disruptor. Um, and as I keep saying to many organizations, we see it in the market that this is something that's here to stay, not here today and, and gone tomorrow. Now, the challenge has been almost a bit about the negativity around AI. Will this take our jobs? Will this, um, you know, how can I explain these decisions? You know, and, and you know, also some, some of the scariness around, I, I don't know how to use it sort of question. So I don't know how to get the best value of it. And again, you know, some of those things around usability, operationalizing is obviously quite fundamental to getting the value out of AI. But more and more, those organizations that embrace this will see categorically them pulling away from their competition as they are becoming more if leaner or they're finding new growth areas that they never seen before. And we're seeing that within Quantexa. New applications, new products that we can bring to market faster and quicker to clients that we can now service that we couldn't service before by further adoption of AI and machine learning as part of our organization. So you've talked about transparency, contextualization, the meaning of data as a really core part of the value of yep. your solutions. With the emergence of generative AI, do you see that giving more challenges to businesses in terms of that trust, contextualization and meaning? So as any model and in any regulated area, explainability is a critical point. Um, so when we're talking about things like large language models working on um, open source data, the burden of explainability and also th therefore trust becomes a huge topical point in every boardroom that's looking to embark on these journeys. Now, not every use case, even in a highly regulated industry, has the burden of explainability. So you do need to distinguish those use cases which are and requires that trust from an ex explanation perspective versus those that do not. So to, to answer your question there, uh, Bina, Gen AI absolutely will be disruptive in organizations. And organizations today are looking at use cases which do require the burden of explainability, but those that do not. And if Gen AI can support in those use cases, we're seeing that adoption today. But one thing is critical in both types of use cases, context to feed those models is more important today than it's ever been. Hence the extra dialogue, the extra um, engagement we're getting both with our new clients as well as our existing clients around how can you feed our models with more context because we're now going on that journey. But if we can provide those models with better context, we're gonna get better outcomes. So it's a, a huge uh, lever for, from, a, from a business standpoint, but it's also our clients embracing the tech, but by truly understanding what are those use cases which need some of that explainability and ones that don't. 
So I want to come back to your journey again. You, you've raised a significant amount of money to fuel growth, and you've talked a little bit about it. What investments are you prioritizing as you look forward? I mean, there's so many things you could do. You've clearly got big ambition. So as you look forward the next 12 to 24 months, where do you really want to invest? There was a phrase I used in all of my all hands, um, which was the multi-multi strategy, which was around multi-industry, multi-use case, and multi-geo. And there were lots of other components to the multi-multi, including the ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. But if I go back to the core of the multi-industry, multi-use case and multi-geo, yeah. the investment we took on this year, plus the investment we took on in 2021, which was um, led by Wahlberg Pincus, we will continue to go down a prioritized set of initiatives across those three multi-multi sectors. And, you know, we announced um, uh, earlier this year our investment into Japan. And uh, we've now formalized our entity set up in Tokyo. And we're already starting to engage with clients in Japan. We did the same in the Middle East with our investment in the UAE. And we continue to invest in countries in Europe, as well as our existing footprints across the US and, and the, the 28 other cities that we, we work in. From an industry perspective, earlier this year, I announced my investment into healthcare. Uh, we continue to invest into healthcare, starting off here in the UK. Um, the UK is sitting on a bed of some of the most valuable data. Are they making the best use of that data in a transparent, scalable, and most importantly, trusting data. Any platform that provides service back to the UK health service has to ensure that transparency, the ethical use of that data, and most importantly, needs to be a trusting partner to the UK government. We're invested by the UK government. So it makes logical sense of the, the disparate nature of that data and more importantly, the fact that we have proven time and time again to be a trusted partner to our clients and being transparent in how we use that data, healthcare was a logical next industry for us to invest in. And, and then the final piece, which is around the different use cases. So as we bucketed them up before, protect, optimize and grow, we will continue to invest in vertical applications across all three. And we're working closely with our partners, such as KPMG, where we've actually taken go to market uh, together. We've taken to market um, use cases such as trigger based KYC or perpetual KYC, where our clients have taken a huge amount of benefit, bringing both the expertise of KPMG as well as the technology of Contexa to catapult their objectives and succeeding their objectives over the last few years. And as you've grown, globally, and like, I love the multi, 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 but as you've multi geoed, um, growing across sort of different territories, um, I'd like to sort of reflect on what you're seeing around skills. And let's start with the UK. How strong do you feel the skills base is in the UK to support the industry that you're in, for example? From a UK standpoint, the, the UK is a fantastic bed of great talent. Talent in uh, areas like cyber, talent in areas like uh, machine learning, around data science, talent in financial services. Um, it's a huge bet of great talent. And you know, with the current um, administration, the great work they're doing around apprenticeships and the apprenticeship scheme, um, also in supporting organizations like Contexa to invest um, from an R&D standpoint into the UK has been great for companies like Contexa. And you know, we continue to do that and continue to recruit here in the UK. My um, announcement that we made a few months ago around our investment of AI in the UK was after a great deal of analysis to ensure that the UK was continues to still be our R&D hub where AI plays a critical role. So it's a great bet. But we also have development centers around the world. Last year, I launched our Malaga 
um, uh, data analytics hub um, and that's gone incredibly well and we continue to invest into Malaga and we've done the same in parts of Asia as well as in the US. You know, in the US across Boston uh, as well as areas in Charlotte and so on, we've recruited some great talent to support many of our clients, not just locally in the US but also internationally as well. Um, so we we've got to continue that investment. The work we're doing in the academy, we've got to continue to do. But this is a lot deeper for me. This is about creating foundational tech. To create foundational tech, we have to go and work with the apprenticeship schemes. We have to work with universities and higher, higher level education because that's how you make a fundamental change in society when it comes down to bridging that gap. Um, so that's a big investment for me and we will continue to do so. So plenty done, um, hell of a lot more to do. Uh, but that investment into education here in the UK is really critical for um, Contexa. I think you just answered the question I was going to ask you, which is how do we preach proof it? And I think that is right, absolutely. How do you work with educational institutions? How does business work with educational institutions to develop their skills? And, and it's also, we've got to look at the diversity nature as well. You know, we, we continue to see, you know, great talent from a number of universities, um, not just a select hand few, uh, but we see it across a number of universities and, you know, if I look at you know the next 10 years, as we continue to grow both here in the UK and abroad, ecosystems and partnerships with the likes of KPMG um, and others, if it's in data or in through the hyperscalers, through the partnerships we have with those, bringing together some of those different use cases and some of those problem statements and working closely with uh, apprenticeship schemes or uh, higher education to solve some of those problems is going to be both exciting but also rewarding for that next generation. You've previously said that one of the great privileges of leading Quantexa is that you get to work with some of the smartest people and more importantly the, some of the most loyal people which is a really lovely thing to be able to say as a leader of a business um, and tone is really very much set at the top so I'd like to understand a little bit about your organisational culture and why you think people join you in the first place as much as why they are loyal. One thing I worked very closely with our uh, people's team um, was a, a big program around how do you scale culture? And me and my chief people's officer, Lorraine, we kept on going in this loop, which was, she kept on saying, what does this mean to you? And I was like, well, it's about doing the right thing. And she goes, yeah, I get that, but what does it mean? And I was like, it's about doing the right thing. So after a number of iterations, we then distilled it down. And then strangely, we came up with an acronym of when we sort of unpicked doing the right thing, which was data. And what data means for Contexa is determination. You know, we need to be as a group determined to ensure we make a delivery without one of our clients. If that's you know, delivering a program for one of the largest organizations on the planet between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, it's about accountability. You know, I'm accountable to my investors. I'm accountable to my Contexa team. I'm accountable to my partners. I'm also accountable to all of my clients and users. That accountability is something that I wake up and go to sleep every night with. Accountability is really co uh, critical. The third piece is around teamwork. And that teamwork is not just us here at Contexa, it's the teamwork with our partners and the broader ecosystem. It's the teamwork between the private sector and the public sector. It's the teamwork that we would have between some of our advisors as well as some of our strategic clients. This is all part of teamwork. And then the final piece, and you mentioned this earlier about me, which was around ambition. And ambition, again, is a very important component because, you know, we don't just want to support an organization by deploying our capabilities for fraud detection only or AML only. It's a journey our clients are going with to transform the way they make decisions. And that's ambition. So, for us, doing the right thing was around data, determination, accountability, teamwork, and ambition. What a lovely way to articulate loyalty data. 
I really, really like that. Um, and as I said earlier, tone is set from the top, and it clearly comes through in the, in, you know, in reflecting how your culture is as well. Um, it's ca it can be quite lonely as a founder. I say it can because not everybody feels it, but I think most founders will tell me that they feel quite lonely because you are accountable to so many stakeholders and you are responsible for the growth and ambition that also creates lots of jobs and helps clients. How do you seek counsel? Where do you go for counsel to keep you? you you've clearly got a very clear barometer internally that says do the right thing, but where do you go to seek the extra counsel? First part to the question, it is and can be quite a lonely place. And I think any CEO, any founder CEO, or any CEO, there will be moments in the day, in the week, on the weekend, where you have to make a decision and you've got the most smartest people working for you and they've come up with all these great ideas and they've come with all the pros and cons but it's up to you to make the recommendation. And I would almost say not making a decision is far worse than making the wrong decision. But this might come a bit strange, um, but some of the big leaders in my, and inspirations in my life, um, and one of those um, I would say is my dad. You know, dad came from India in 1961 um, with one shilling in his pocket. And, um, you know, he came here in the UK for a better life um, for his family. And, you know, my dad's now 83. And, um, you know, he had a, a cash and carry and, you know, uh, wholesale um, um, shops and so on, which I worked at when I was at I mean, I'm five years old, six years old, all the way up to 16, 17. You know, most kids after school went home. I went and worked with dad and mum. And mustn't forget mum in that whole process. Mum was the anchor of the cash and carry. Um, she worked six days a week. Um, and, you know, so weirdly, in a very different scale that I run Quantexa, there are some fundamentals of business which are very similar to the cash and carry business. You know, I'll give you an example, right? So when we um, closed Series D, I was delighted. It was remote raise. Um, you know, we hadn't done this before. Um, great firm with Warburg Pinkers. Great people at Warburg. Uh, really delighted. Really delighted. Go to my dad. I go, Dad, um, you know, we closed Warburg um, and our Series D. Great partner. And he looked at me, that's great news, Vish. Are you profitable yet? You know, it was like... Thank you. I love you too. But it was, it was almost taking me back to, you know, when we had the cash and carry, when that unit economics around profitability is critical for a business. And showing the path to profitability is critical. Now, we did have an answer and we continue to drive to that answer. But, you know, there's these parallels where, you know, I take counsel, less so now um, with dad, uh, but, you know, he's definitely been you know, that anchor behind me. I love the parallel that you've just given there. You know, how you can learn from every experience in your life, no matter what you've done, where you've done, and people around you. You are right. In, in life, there's so many experiences, and, you know, you learn so much every day, so much working with great colleagues like yourself. And, you know, the, the key thing in business, I've always said, don't be stubborn. If you could go back to your younger self, Vishal, what advice would you give your younger self today um, and why would you give it? I think it's something I do already, but I think it's something I would like to do more. And creating more time in the day for thinking time um, comes a bit about that lonely time that you mentioned earlier, but getting more time in the day. And, you know, it's, you know, business is busy. I'm also a husband, a dad, a son, a brother. And, you know, you have all of these other um, responsibilities, right? So um, 
getting more time in the day for thinking time, I would almost mandate it. Just like how I would man a client meeting or an investor's briefing or an employee's meeting. I would mandate that time in my diary earlier on. Maybe it would be in a different place. I think that's such a lovely place to finish. Creating time to think, we all do it. And you did talk about a little bit about that, about how do you make decisions that you don't have to reverse. And the only way you can make those decisions when you're you know, running against time is to create that little bit of headspace to just think it through, think about the consequences that we don't always have time to think about. And fast forwarding all your experience for others. Um, I'm just gonna summarize what I've taken. There's so much in there, so much in there. I won't even try and do the technical pieces, but what comes through right through the core of everything we've talked about is doing the right thing. You started with that. That was one of the very first things you talked about. And it's exactly where we've ended up, right, in terms of doing the right thing. You talk about data, contextualization, really being clear about the trust, the transparency, the meaning, and what you're trying to deliver as an outcome. I think it's always sometimes helpful to remind ourselves that actually have the outcome in mind, not just think about the process or the journey. Because some of the biggest, grittiest issues that we're all facing into cannot be dealt with on our own. We have to do it in partnership, whichever way you look at it, whether it's skills, whether it's you know solutions. So I, I think that's a really core cool message. And what I absolutely love is data, determination, accountability, teamwork. And of course, it's Vishal Maria, so it's ambition too. Thank you so much for joining me today. A huge pleasure being here, thank you.